the iPhone. Now, apparently, that's doing what uh, it was alleged Windows Phone 7 did uh, about a year or so ago, which was uh, gobbling up data. I don't know if you heard anything about that over there, Rusty. It's a very short, uh, a very short paragraph, I think, where I read it. I'm trying desperately to have a look so I can pull up the article. I can't, I can't see it now. Um, but basically, it was saying that people that were using this app were um, or feature were consuming twice as much uh, of their monthly allowance if they have one. Um, as a result of using it, I can't find it now. I can't find it now. It'll have to be something that we bring up. Uh, I, I I would believe that because the way Siri works is the same way the voice search works on Android. You know, it makes a query to the cloud and says, "Process this for me," then send it back. Uh, and I, I just I, I must I, have, I must because I have a, a colleague at work who's got an iPhone and um, she was showing me how uh, how it worked and uh, I was quite impressed. It was quite a. Uh, Quite an impressive little feature. She, uh, the the example she gave was, uh, she said to the phone something like, uh, "Tell Tim to give me a call." And then I got a text message through saying, uh, "Give me a call." And it was uh, obviously from my colleague. So I was, quite, I was quite impressed with that. I mean, I know obviously the technology's been around for, for quite a while. We've had it from Google, the Google search, but it's, it's still uh, quite a, quite a miraculous or uh, marvelous uh, little feature to have. Um, if well, and actually, the funny thing is, the technology they're using in Siri is a spin-off of a military project of all things. <laughs> I, I still, I still would doubt the merits, though, of uh, voice-activated functions in the long run. Um, if I'm looking at my desktop now, and think how long it would take me to say, I don't know, boot IRC, uh, boots uh, Xtrat in order to get my IRC cards, it'd be much quicker just to have an icon on the desktop that I double click. I could well, do that no, you, or just use the keyboard. Key well, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's going to always be the diehards that are going to use the keyboard and the mouse, and for a lot of things, I'm always going to use the keyboard and the mouse. However, you're forgetting that we now have uh, rather dynamic heuristic, uh, well-established heuristic things, and the reality is you could implement on top of voice technology a variable algorithm where it's a by-user basis. Basically, it goes, I know this is voice pattern A, voice pattern A tends to launch these applications all the time, so it would know when you start talking about IRC, you're meaning to launch IRC, where you don't have to give it a command, it kind of learns your preferences, and that technology is available today, it just hasn't been implemented that way. Well, even if it's something like uh, join tech rights, and it would automatically go to the three nodes and, um, and join me to the tech rights channel, it's still not as quick. It's just double clicking on like I, I can't really see, apart from the gimmicks side of things, and maybe a yeah. few uh, few few times where you need a feature like that. For the general computer usage, I can't see I just can't see it taking off. Uh, I prefer to type than talk. If I could I've tried dictating to people before who can type very, very quickly and I just can't do it because my thought processes rely on the fact that my keyboard my hands touch the keyboard and I'm thinking about the subject that I'm uh, typing about. So I just tried this about five not five years, maybe six years ago. They tried it with Vista and then there was, you know, some talk about shout hacking and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, the matter of fact, it never really took. It never really. It was used for marketing when they released the operating system as a sort of feature that's already been around for a long time. Especially with, is it called Dragon Speaking or Dragon 3D Speaking, whatever it's called. Well, well you're uh, talking about the text to type dictation stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. Dragon. And and even even commands. You know, you could issue commands to your computer. But you know, the main situation where you would use voice is if you're on the move, if you're like cycling or something and you want to do something on your phone, uh, you know, you don't have your hands on it, so you might as well use voice and it might read things out to you, but uh, um, that would have to be a very, yeah. It certainly has a good application if you were to look at somebody who's disabled, for example, it could open up a whole new world to them if it was accurate enough to perfectly dictate everything that they were saying and perfectly tune to and learn to their voice. For, so for somebody disabled who maybe can't use a keyboard or maybe doesn't have the coordination for a mouse, um, it'd be it'd be a fantastic piece of technology, I think. Um, I just can't personally see the mainstream user who maybe is used to the desktop form factor really having a lot. Well, of and, and honestly, what you're getting at there is one of the primary reasons I think everybody in Google, Apple, even Microsoft is considering re-implementing voice control technology, even though it's you know like you have a kid in the backseat going blah, 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 just to, just to mess with you. Um, but the real problem with that is it's a solution being created to deal with an underlying problem in these devices, which is, it pains me to say this, the UIs are very unsophisticated at this point. They're, they're, they're too simple, they're not really elegant, 
and that goes for all the platforms, uh, regardless. But it's just that you, and it, it, it's one of the things that actually bugs me the heck about this transition we're going through. We're, we're losing the base functionality of UI, and it's almost like you need to just scrap everything and go back to a blank screen and go, okay, let me justify every single thing in here in terms of UI so it's actually intuitive. Unfortunately, I suppose you've got a massive market of consumer that is used to a set way of doing it, rightly or wrongly, whether it is as productive as it could be. You've got a great many people who are going to be very reticent to make any changes to the way they've been used to working. Um, and especially in enterprise, I would think that they, uh, it would be even less, less enthusiastic to make the change because of the fact that not so much retraining costs, but there would be productivity costs initially while people went to this new UI that would ultimately uh, increase productivity. So uh, I, th I think they've got themselves in a difficult position. Having said that, though, I mean, I look at things like GIMP um, and a few other packages, and I can't remember the name of the graphics package that I was using once, which was for video editing. And to be fair, it looked like the cockpit of a Boeing 747. There was buttons everywhere, and mm -hmm. I just fathom exactly what was going on. Conversely, you get the very simple ones, and then you're scratching your head to think as to where, uh, where your option is, because you just can't see. I mean, Skype, I think, is far too simple, and for a while, you're flicking on trying to work out where a certain feature was until you realize that there's a little icon down the left hand side of the screen. It's just yeah, another. And what you're getting at there is um, part of why UI is such an in demand job right now because it's something that it people think less can be more, but it can also make a mountain out of a molehill. I think there's been a lot of changes around the uh, CMS, especially the open source ones, but perhaps not. Okay, the open source ones are free. But you would choose between Drupal and WordPress and all kinds of other applications based on how simple they are to operate, not just by yourself, but also the person you install it for. So they've had loads of changes trying to simplify things over time. Uh, and I remember the older days, even the way you install things and you put plugins, or uh, that all kind of determines what the what the success will be of the application, that this is what people are seeing. Yeah, but um, stay, staying on the subject of. Um, multiple platforms, um, if I may. I've got another topic to bring up here. And since we just finished with Christmas and it's now well past the new year really and we're, we're getting into 2012, I thought I'd take a quick look at the sales figures for maybe Microsoft's last bastion of salvation, which is going to be its, uh, its console and its, uh, its sales. Now, arguably, Microsoft has done quite well with its Xbox 360. I don't think uh, many people can argue that it hasn't, it's, uh, has, has been a, a success. I, I think it has been. Um, varying degrees of success depending on which country you come from. And in America, that's where the Xbox 360 seems to have flourished the most, as the figures as we believe. But this Christmas has seen a, a rather interesting trend. And I'm just looking at some of the figures. Now, the first one I want to discuss was um, Australia. And it's probably a country we don't see in the news very often when it comes to uh, sales and computing and tech. I certainly haven't seen many articles on Australia. But apparently the PlayStation 3 has outsold the... Xbox 360 by a ratio of 3 to 1. Now, both the 360 and the PS3 both had a price drop over the Christmas period, and for 2011, Sony has still managed to outsell the 360 console, which must be rather upsetting for Microsoft, seeing as though there's a lot of money to be made in their uh, on -live, uh, on -live, sorry, the online services that they offer, and trying to get the Xbox into the home of every user. So that was quite interesting, which made me look at the global sales figures, and that was also quite revealing as to trends in different countries. Um, myself and Roy from the UK, and if I may, I'll just bring up the Europe uh, figures. For 2011 in Europe, uh, the Xbox sold 19.9 million units, and that's 26%, 26.7% of the market. This is according to VGC charts. The PS3 is at 23.6, and the Wii beat them both at 30.9. Um, what also is interesting, obviously, Japan, as you'd expect, is a, is another uh, PS3 market, and not an Xbox market. And whilst we're led to believe that the 360, and I've debated with Roy quite a few times on this matter, that the 360 is the most popular console, it seems to be from these figures that the only place it is the most popular is in America. Yeah. And maybe why uh, American figures, in the terms of global PR, take precedence over the actual true uh, sales figure for the entire planet. Depends on the language. Yeah. Um, it, look at it, 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 it depends on the language and it depends on the market. Um, 
I mean, what what I've also got here was the um, the software charts, which was also quite interesting because obviously if there's a discrepancy in the units that are sold and the units that are being used in in homes, then the top selling software.